Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. I'm Karen Hartman, IRO in Rome. We're very fortunate to have with us today Professor Henry Jenkins. Dr. Jenkins is the Provost Professor of Communication, Journalism, and Cinematic Arts at the University of Southern California. He also served as Director of the Comparative Media Studies Program at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology for 10 years. In addition to being the author and or editor of 12 books on various aspects of media and popular culture, he is also the principal investigator for the project New Media Literacies Group. Dr. Jenkins writes and speaks about participatory and fan culture and how old and new media are converging. He is on the forefront of studying the intersections between commercial and grassroots culture and living within a network society. He also has a really cool blog called Confessions of an ACA Fan, which means academic fan. Thank you, Professor Jenkins, for being with us today. We are excited to hear more about the transmedia generation. Professor Jenkins will answer your questions after his talk. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here, and hello, world. Um, so when we talk about the current generation of young people, there's been a tendency for scholars and activists around the world to use the term transmedia gener the, the digital generation, or often in the American context, digital natives. Uh, and that's been a useful shorthand to describe the way young people learn today in somewhat different fashion than their parents' or grandparents' generation have tended to learn. Um, what we're seeing is... Um, what we're, what we're seeing, though, is that, that that terminology misleads us as much as it leads us. It somewhat distorts the nature of access to media around the world. So we know in the American context that about 95% of young people have some access to network computing. But a high percentage of those have access through schools and public libraries and not through the home. So we can imagine a series of differentials that affect the way young people connect with media. The bluntest is the question of digital access, or what people have called the digital divide. Who has access to the technology itself? And we could tell among the 5% of particularly Native Americans living on reservations who have historically lagged well behind in terms of access to other kinds of communication technologies. But even if you're the 95% that has access to digital media, you might still have only access through schools and public libraries where there's mandatory filtering, where you're blocked often from using YouTube, Facebook, blogging technologies, social media of all kinds. And so again, there's differential access. Um, beyond that, though, there's differential opportunities to participate. So some young people have mentorship in their lives, that is, adults who are able to guide them toward communities online that are deeply meaningful to them. And most young people, it turns out, according to work of Harvard University, uh, Howard Gardner's team, um, the Good Play Project, that most young people don't have any adults they turn to that give them information about digital media or the ethical or safety issues they face as they enter into that space. Some young people may have access to that world, may be learning in powerful ways through what I call participatory culture, but not have a way of connecting that to what they're learning at school. And MacArthur Foundation has launched the Connected Learning Initiative to sort of focus on the need to bridge between informal learning outside of school and what takes place inside the classroom. And then some people are able to use the technology but feel less empowered. They don't feel entitled to speak and share what they're creating to the world. So each of those represents separate kinds of divides, both the digital divide, the participation gap, the empowerment gap, these gaps affect how young people access technology. As we move globally, those, those gaps become even greater. The world is anything but flat. The different regions of the world have different regulatory structures, different degrees of access to technology. So we can't really talk about digital natives on a global scale, and we can scarcely talk about it on the American scale. What we are seeing, though, is around the world a push toward the desire to participate in meaningful ways in conversations, a desire to participate in our culture, which is a byproduct of the new modes of address that media are making in our lives. So increasingly, mass media 
follows a transmedia logic, which is to say that um, any story, any sound, any image is going to play itself out across the maximum number of media channels, shaped both by decisions made in corporate boardrooms and by decisions made in teenagers' bedrooms. That some teenagers are getting that only through the mass media, but the mass media itself is assuming up active participation, ways we engage with its contents that are very different from storytelling in the past. This is what we mean by transmedia. Transmedia simply means a story that's told across media, a story that gives us access to core elements that we can meaningfully use in the context of our own participation. Um, a story like Heroes or Lost or Glee plays itself across everywhere. Glee, for example, in the American context, has now produced more number one hit songs than either, either the Elvis, Elvis or the Beatles, and it's done so in under two years, in part because it's moved across media platforms. It's encouraged people to perform its songs, to remix its songs, to engage with it in creative ways. And this is part of the story of our time. This is not just a top-down story. It's not just Pokemon. It's not just He-Man. It's not just, you know, not just Star Wars. It's also the way we're conducting politics, whether we're talking about the Arab Spring movement or some of the struggles that are taking place in Russia, or we're talking about the Occupy movement in the United States or the Dream Activist. Any number of youth movements today are taking advantage of every available media platform. It's not right to describe this as a Twitter, Twitter revolution because that's to confuse a single platform with a logic of participation. So I'm working now with the MacArthur Foundation as part of a larger research network that's looking at youth and political participation. And we're doing ethnographic case studies of any number of movements that have been incredibly effective at getting young people involved in the political process, often through remixing media content, often through building on the skills they've acquired as fans or participants in mass media. So to take Occupy, for example, last fall I was in New York we went to the side of Occupy Wall Street uh, there, and what we saw was, as I arrived, a busload of zombies started on pouring out. And these were zombies from a, fans from a local horror convention that had shown up to participate in the protest, and they were, became wrapped up in the Occupy movement. But they were not unique in coming dressed as a figure from popular culture. As I wandered the park, we saw a mask from V for Vendetta, the Guy Fawkes mask, we saw um, people dressed like characters from Games of Thrones. We saw Sesame Street uh, posters that said 99% of the cookies go to 1% of the monsters. We saw any number of references to popular culture. We saw, for example, in California, where the University of California campus policemen pepper sprayed some of the protesters, that within two days there were more than 200 remixes of that, of that image mixed up with famous paintings, news photography, scenes from movies, and this became a way of spreading that story across media platforms. This was content designed to travel across the culture, to participate in a variety of different conversations going on in different networks. Some of these things traveled digitally, some of them were printed out and put into posters, but they represent a logic of connecting your message across media channels. It also involves a different logic about how politics is constructed across popular culture than we've seen in the past. In the 1960s, protesters, for example, might have created a counterculture, underground comics, underground radio, but here they're appropriating mass media as the resources, the shared resources through which they tell their own stories. This is not just a U.S.-based movement. I recently co-edited an especial issue of an online journal called Transformative Works and Culture on fan activism, and we got essays submitted from all over the world with case studies from across Asia, from parts of Europe, uh, particularly strong examples of people remixing the content of popular culture in ways that allow them new groups to speak and tell their stories. I've written about the case of avatar activism, people who've dressed up like the Navi from James Cameron's avatar in order to participate in protest. Uh, Amazon Indians in Brazil against the logging companies, miners in India versus the corporate ownership, indigenous people in China versus the government, uh, Palestinians against Israelis, each were embodied as struggles using the themes and images from Avatar. Now this has a lot of policy implications and hopefully we can talk about some of them as we go forward. One of them is the educational implications. How do we train this new generation?
How do we help them acquire the skills they need in connecting stories together, telling stories, processing stories that are told across media channels? What does the new media literacies look like? And how, what roles should adults, teachers, and librarians play in shaping their access to these skills? How do we deal with the various divides I just described? A second has to do with intellectual property law, both in the U.S. and around the world. If people are forming political speech through remixing media content, how does that relate to ongoing debates about piracy, about copyright, about trademark, some of the struggles that have existed across the digital era between copyright producers and copyright users, I think, are going to be very important questions. And third, what does it tell us about the future of politics and the future of activism? If a young generation is coming up with one hand on the mouse and the other hand holding up a sign that is both living in virtual and physical worlds, what does the politics of the future look like? And how can we understand these various worldwide movements toward democracy that we've been seeing in relation to the transmedia logics I've just described. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, thank you so much for that. I, I, you could just go on and on um, for me. Um, I, I do have some questions. Great. Um, the first question you just touched on, it was um, how can you protect the rights of the author as we transit into this new era of transmedia and self-publishing? Do you have any ideas on how we can do that? Well, we, we can start with a very basic challenge, which is the notion of a moral economy. Uh, cultural historian E.P. Thompson tells us that when that underlying the economic system is a moral system, that before we can trade with each other, we have to trust each other. And that when there is a significant disruption, economic, technological, social, political, the moral economy gets disrupted and has to be reestablished. Mm -hmm. This happened in the Middle Ages as the shift from feudalism to capitalism, and it's something Thompson writes about. Well, we've undergone that same change now. So, that, mm -hmm. you know, digital media has disrupted the ways authors and readers relate to each other. Mm -hmm. And both sides that are undergoing a process of legitimization. One side is saying, barring or remixing content equals piracy. The other side is saying sharing is caring. These are two extremes in a debate that I think is going to have to sort itself out over the coming de decade. And so we're going to mm -hmm. see a remixing, a rethinking of these. Clearly, we need to protect the rights of authors to get compensation for the works that they produce. We also clearly have to protect the right of the public to draw on the ideas that are central to the culture. That's the original agreement in the U.S. Constitution mm -hmm. between copyright and fair use. The challenge is, when for that exchange to work out again, we have to reestablish trust in both sides. And I think the only way we get there is to involve the public much more directly than in the past mm -hmm. with the conversations about copyright. We've got to have creative rights holders and the public at the table. Yeah. And historically, Hollywood has dominated debates in Congress over intellectual property, but we saw with the recent controversies around copyright this past year that more and more people are tapping in the networks, getting involved, weighing in on copyright decisions, mm -hmm. and uh, the so-called SOPA bill that was proposed this year, the, the right. government backed off and is rethinking it as a response to the amount of public participation in those yeah. conversations. And I think that's the beginning of a process that allows us then to work out what a new moral contract between writers and readers is going to look like. Okay, well, the next question, um, you just touched on that as well. Um, can you give more examples of the changing relationship between authors and readers through this new type of transmedia interaction? Sure, I think, I think we could start with, I'll uh, give you two examples of contemporary, uh, three examples of contemporary authorial practice. The first is Cory Doctorow, who's a science fiction writer whose philosophy has been that mm -hmm. more authors suffer from... Um, from um, ah, more authors suffer from obscurity than from piracy. The idea is that the goal of most authors is to get known, to get their works out there, to get their works into the public eye. And what Doctorow has tended to do is give away his books for free on the internet uh, with even a Creative Commons license, which allows people to translate or remix them in various ways. And then he publicizes what the public has done. The result of that is he's gained enough visibility that he's set the New York Times bestseller list multiple times with his book. People are buying physical copies mm -hmm. of the books, even though they have a free copy that's available in a digital form. Mm 
A second story would be the story of Kickstarter, right? In the American context, it's not a worldwide company yet, but Kickstarter is a way that authors can seek, fun of all kinds, can seek funding for their projects by encouraging the investment of their fans. So people can invest a small amount of money to support an independent author, record maker, mm -hmm. comics publisher, games designer, tele film producer, and get build a support or relationship from conception forward. Uh, and I think that's going to change the way this stuff operates. The third example would be the Shades of Grey story, right? This is oh. a top bestseller that began as a piece of Twilight fan fiction. It was written, uh, the fan fiction world is a place where literally hundreds of thousands of original stories each year are posted by fans and response to copyrighted materials, films, television shows, books, and so forth. There's a strong base of critique and self-improvement self that's built in there, mm -hmm. and out of which comes some, a lot of bad stuff, but a lot of really amazing pieces of writing. And Shades of Grey crossed over, was rewritten after it ran as a piece of Twilight fan fiction and turned into a popular bestseller that has been successful around the world. So here's a case of the fans making a bridge from fan production to commercial production in a way that's starting to have an impact on the culture. And as that's happened, other writers have started to come out of the closet and say, yeah, they began as fan fiction writers as well. Wow, I had no idea about that. Shades of Grey, um, orig orig how that originated. We have another question here. It's a little different. Um, than the others. At the beginning of the internet, most people thought that English was becoming the language for the entire world to communicate. Have, has social media changed that picture? Is English still the language for international communication? Well, I think I would make a distinction, as I think is implied by that question, between internal conversations that might take place within mm -hmm. a friendship group or a social network and mm -hmm. conversations which are intended to be global. I'm just finishing up a 12-country tour of Europe and almost everywhere I've gone, English is certainly available as an option for a large number of people. And the younger you are, the more likelihood that English has become a central mode of conversation within the European community. Um, I think that's partially a product of the Internet. I think that, part, you know, it's probably trends that have already started. But I think we're seeing that in our everyday life, online as well as offline, offline as well as online, people are engaging in conversation in what people are calling globish, uh, mm -hmm. global English. Um, mm -hmm. I think, I think where, but I think we're also seeing uh, very specific conversations within countries. The Arab Spring would be an interesting example mm -hmm. of this. You know, a lot of discussions going on of whether the Arab Spring was a Twitter revolution. Well, if, if we go back to the uh, first Iranian uprising, for example, for the Farsi alphabet was not yet supported by Twitter at the time those events took place. The most significant communication there was not between the protesters in the streets, but between the protesters in a larger community. The goal was to get their message out without going through governmental or media gatekeepers and to talk directly with both the Iranian diaspora around the world, but also through them to other supporters or potential supporters. And I think the real impact there was not internal, the conversations that might have taken place within Farsi, but global the conversations which were supported by English. And I think that's a distinction we want to make as we think about the future of communication on the web. Other nationalities certainly will communicate. Portu I'm finding large numbers of Portuguese readers for my stuff coming from Brazil primarily. We're seeing other countries actively communicating ab about sort of new media issues. But I think English has emerged as a central, if not the central language through which digital communications globally is taking place. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, okay, here's another question. How do you think the role of publishers will change now that readers have more control of the story? Well, I think we're going to have to we'd have to make a distinction between different levels of publication. I think we're going to see more writers self-publishing, mm -hmm. forming their own relationships directly to readers mm -hmm. in ways that are both compensated and uncompensated, or rather directly compensated, that is sales of books or under, uh, indirectly compensated through other kinds of relationships, speaking tours, t-shirts, mugs, and so forth. We have already see this start to happen with comics, uh, where more and more of the publishing is online, and more and more writers are becoming profitable by forging new kinds of relationships to their readers. We're starting to see this with self-publishing initiatives through Amazon, for example, that are creating more and more 
books that are being read by significant niches, if not by a general public at the present time. We will see in the academic world, academic publishers struggling to survive, moving more and more into digital publishing as a way of decreasing the cost of paper. Already, I think I'm seeing that academic publishers are willing to publish shorter and shorter books, which is having an impact on scholarship and our ability to deal with substantive topics. And so I think the challenge is going to be how do we create new modes of publishing there. I think the gatekeeping function of academic presses remains very, very strong. That this, the, able to credentialize and certify the strengths of a publication means that there are certain advantages of going through a university press that self-publishing for an academic or blogging for an academic don't carry. I think the potential of digital publishing then will open up a space for academic works to be read by a larger public. I've already seen that in my blog where most of my readers are not university-based. But as you do that, you end up writing any more generally accessible prose than academic writing of the last couple of generations have been. I think mm -hmm. we'll see a new generation of academics who are very comfortable speaking to the public and because they're more and more reliant on self-publishing modes to get their ideas out into the world. Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, okay, here's another one. Uh, do you support the use of video games by kids? Well, I don't think the question is whether I support it or not. The last time I saw the American numbers are about 95% of boys and something like 90% of girls are playing video games. So it's a little late to close the door. The question is, what's, what are the value of that? Uh, and what we're seeing is that, in fact, games are, are very effective as an engine through getting kids to think about the world around them. We can talk about games like SimCity or The Spore or the Civilization series. They're very effective at simulating and modeling complex real-world processes. And so we're seeing success stories of those kinds of games being generated in the, in the classroom. We're also seeing games that are very much about choice and consequence. Mm -hmm. And choice and consequence opens the door for ethical considerations around games. So on the positive side, games offer us a lot of opportunities, affordances for new kinds of communication that are really worth supporting. On the negative side, I am more less worried than a lot of critics of games about the negative effects of games. Uh, certainly they are possible. Uh, certainly they're things we should be as parents or teachers or educators informed about, aware about the games that young people are consuming. But as a general rule, media is most effective when it supports the things we already believe and least effective when it seeks to challenge our beliefs and behaviors. So I think for those parents who are, or those kids who are raised in a supportive environment, games become only one cultural influence among many, and they don't negate or overwhelm the other inf the factors like the home family or the school and that young person's life. Under some circumstances where there's already a tendency toward violence elsewhere in the culture, they could reinforce that tendency toward violence. And so it's not a matter of do we have them or do we not, but it's rather about how do we build a support around the generation of young people that are playing games, how do we make sure adults around them are better informed about the, game, the role games are playing in their lives. Not governed by fear, not by a desire to support a medium, but by a rational response to a changed media environment. And this goes back to what I said earlier about a lack of mentorship, um, the lack of trained adults who can help support young people as they make decisions about what media is appropriate in their lives, what role it should play, how to connect it with other aspects of their lives. The games is a place where more adults should be aware of what young people are playing and involved in the process of helping them relate what happens in the game to the other choices and values that are surrounding them. <clears throat> Thank you so much for that answer. Um, here's a, uh, another question. Do you think blogs are still a good communication channel, or are they being replaced by new media like Twitter, etc.? Is it really possible to convey a message in 140 characters? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, the answer is probably no. I don't mm. think you can convey a very complex argument in 144 characters, right? Yeah. Someone mm -hmm. asked me if Marshall McLuhan said that media, the medium is the message, what's the message of Twitter? Yeah. And the message of Twitter is first, here I am. This is who I am. This is my life. I'm still there. A reminder of our friends, of our social contacts with each other. And the second message is, here it is. Here's something you should pay attention to. Mm 
So Twitter is maybe most effective at publicizing links, at sharing bits of information with each other uh, that are important to us. So I still blog, and I blog at great length three times a week, but I also use Twitter and have, use it as a way of, of connecting the blog to other conversations that are taking place in the culture or responding to questions I get from readers. As you can tell here, my questions are rarely short, so uh, blo Twitter blogging is a better way often for me to respond to the complex questions people are asking than Twitter is, but Twitter has proven to be very effective at a means of spreading the information I'm creating around to different populations. It's easier to retweet and so forth. As a blog writer, I miss the more substantive responses to my blog that I got in, a, in an age of Twitter, that I got before we had Twitter, but Twitter helps me to monitor the scope and scale, the spread of my ideas across the culture because it's so easy for people to retweet and it's easy for me to trace where the retweets are coming from. All right. Um, another question. Uh, we recently heard from Lee Rainey. We had Lee Rainey um, here a few months ago from Pew Internet Trust. And he said that people are looking at their social media friends more and more as advisors and censors, especially when reading news stories online. Do you share that? How do you see the news cycle changing or adapting to this? Well, this goes to the heart of the new book we have come, I have coming out early next year, which is I've written with Sam Ford and Joshua Green, and it's called Spreadable Media, Creating Meaning and Value in a Networked Culture. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to describe there is the way media spreads across the culture, the ways uh, networks of people shape the flow of ideas, put ideas on the agenda. We already talked about Twitter and Iran as maybe a classic example where the American public at least engaged with the debates that were taking place in Iran in a new way as that information traveled through their social networks. As that happened, as that took place, the, the hashtag CNN fail became very dominant in that mm -hmm. discussion, which to me suggests that the public wanted CNN to in fact cover this, that there were things professional journalists did uh, that were really hard for individuals to do through social media and they expected a kind of accountability from journalists to ensure that, that cover, the story was covered. In other words, we're seeing the public say, here's what we want to see covered, give us more information. And the question is going to be, how does the news media respond to that? A more exa recent example of that would be Cooney 2012, the work of Invisible Children. It's a 30-minute human rights video about Uganda child soldiering that the organizers thought might reach half a million people over two months time based on their previous experience actually reached 77 million people in four days time as it spread through social media. And in context across North America and Europe in particular, that video sparked lots of discussions about policy in Africa, led to coverage in mainstream newspapers, led to editorial debates about what was right or wrong for dealing with child soldiering. Many, many, there were many strong critics of the video, including those from Africa, and many Ugandans took to YouTube to respond to that video in very harsh ways often, very incisive ways often, that challenged some of its core assumptions. But it was a, a discussion sparked by acts of circulation, by people spreading this information through social media in ways that it became embedded in their ordinary conversations with each other. And I think that's part of what we need to understand better and as educators or people concerned with information, figure out what our active role should be in that. How do we participate in those conversations? So we ensure that the quality of information we're transmitting to each other is reliable. Because the same thing that led to Americans engaging more closely with debates in Iran and Egypt has led to many Americans still believing Barack Obama is Islamic or was not born in the United States. In other words, misinformation spreads to these systems just as much as reliable information. And so I think educators and journalists have very active roles to play in critically engaging with the quality of information that's circulating through social media. Yeah, it's absolutely true. Critical thinking skills are more important than ever. Um, here's another question. You're mentioning academic and science fiction genres mostly. Do you think other literary genres will enter this new era too? I think we're going to see all kinds of stories told in new ways as a result of our expectations of stories being told across media. I think transmedia started with science fiction mm 
in part because there was a dedicated, active network of fans that had been in place for more than 100 years. Mm -hmm. And the writers had, most of the writers came out of that fan community. It's also a genre that encouraged early adapters of technologies to embrace those stories and use them in new ways. I think as these practices become more mainstream, we're going to see a variety of other literary genres begin to embrace story, modes of storytelling. I think the key test is the question of worlds versus stories. That is, the kinds of stories that work best in a transmedia environment are those that have rich and complex worlds that support more than one story. It's not just the plot of a book, but it's about a system of stories. We see, you know, we see this in terms of the Bible or medieval text or, often, or folk tales often connect lots of stories together, the inter interarching mythology of a culture. And I think we'll see it, for example, first maybe in historical fiction. <coughs> mm -hmm. A novel that tells a story that captures a moment in the past, whether it's Roman history or Victorian England, or I love to use the example of Gangs of New York as a, as a really rich text that there's a lot going in on it going on in that story. As I read that story as a, as a novel or watch the film of Gangs of New York, I want to dig deeper. And so the idea of texts that combine fiction and nonfiction together in robust ways, or stories that branch off and through a variety of other media supplement the core story and experience of the book, I think we're going to see more and more. And we're starting to see writers who are ready to deal with this kinds of storytelling. Here in Italy I met with the Wu Ming uh, group, which is a long-standing group of writers of Italian fiction, both popular and literary fiction, who said that they're more and more experimenting with transmedia as part of how they tell their stories as they try to connect the story they're creating with a generation that wants to read across media. I think as we move toward the Kindle and the iPad as distribution channels, we're going to see the incorporation of film and video of images into the text in really robust ways. We could think about Hugo as a recent book uh, that combined mm -hmm. pictures and words in very powerful ways. And imagine Hugo, which is our, after all about the origins of cinema, being told as a digital experience that combined Miliez's films with photographs of Paris at the turn of the century with a variety of both historical and fictional text just take the, open, the kind of mixed media style of that book and expand it outward in ways that tell a new kinds of stories. And we can even imagine taking advantage of my information appliances, my mobile phone, and having a Hugo-like experience as I travel through Paris. I visited the Museum d'Orsay, which is where the train station originally was that the film was set in. And I can imagine not just looking at the art that's in that space, but having a way with my mobile phone of engaging with the earlier history of that building and en even engaging with new chapters of the stories of the characters who lived and worked around the train station in the Hugo novel. That's wonderful. Um, okay, we have um, another one here. What do you think of the interaction between TV and Twitter? Do you think TV users are willing to use Twitter to interact during a TV program? I think we're seeing plenty of signs that Twitter plays some important roles in the ways people are relating to television. At the USC, the Annenberg Innovation Lab has a Twitter, Twitter sentiment analysis, which is trying to process large-scale flows of Twitter around public events. They've used it to look at uh, the presidential debates. They've used it to look at um, Super Bowl. They've used it to look at the Oscars. They're looking at sort of things where people both speculate going into and then participate very actively in exchanges during the broadcast. And they're able to, in split seconds, read shifts in public reaction to the events, both quantitatively in terms of the, how much information is flowing, but also qualitatively to then drill down and look at very specific posts and understand what's going on. In terms of television in specific, it suggests that, in fact, fans may play an even bigger role in shaping patterns of television than we've seen before. We've seen in film, for example, that um, Twitter is a very good predictor of box office returns. Not only because the people using Twitter are those most likely to go to movies on the weekend, but also because they're influencers or that as a community they shape other people's opinions. So the films people get excited about on Twitter often build excitement, amplify the buzz around a particular release. And the same thing takes place around television, that it may be one hardcore fan draws 15 to 20 casual viewers in to watch a particular 
program. And we're seeing kind of shows, Once Upon a Time this year is maybe an example of a series on American television that's built based on that support. Or Walking Dead, or Game of Thrones, or True Blood, or all series where Twitter buzz played a decisive role in building awareness of a new show and getting it through the clutter of an ever more complex media landscape. So I think we are seeing people using Twitter in real time to react. We're also seeing Twitter as the place by which they talk about what they've seen and in the process draw viewers in to watch television shows they might not have seen otherwise. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um what role do you think online games will play in making a difference? There recently was a story of an online game helping with AIDS research. Will this be the exception and games remain firmly recreational? Well, I, I think okay. one of the things I argued at the end of my book, Convergence Culture, Where Old and New Media co co Collide, was that we are acquiring through play skills that we will increasingly apply to more serious aspects of our lives. And in that book, I talked about religion, education, politics, as spaces where that kind of practice takes place. This can take place in a variety of ways. Um, the example you're talking about has, or is one of several recent examples where games have been a way of collecting data or allowing lots of people to make very small-scale decisions which allowed them, as a, as a group, to shape decision making. Um, and that's sort of games as a way of harnessing collective intelligence is one very promising direction. Um, we're also seeing examples though where games themselves become powerful communities with the, where important debates take place. In convergence culture I described the debate that took place on The Sims Online as they struggled to choose a mayor of a, of a virtual town and the way in which that mirrored the debates that were taking place in American politics post 2000, post Florida, the question about whose votes counts how do votes count? Those conversations were being held by teens and 20-somethings you know, around the question of whether how legitimate an online election might be. And it's a really fascinating story that convergence culture tells about that. We've seen games become a site of political protest. In China, for example, where it could be very dangerous for young people to get out in, in Tiananmen Square again and hold a public protest, people have registered their disagreement with government policies and on the scales of hundreds of thousands of participants by using avatars to move through a game space, which allowed them to signal the level of support they had or opposition they had to public policies. So each of these represent game ways online games might make a difference in the real world. Doesn't mean they won't be recreational. In almost all of these cases, there is a recreational component. But it means that as we take games seriously and as we think take online communities seriously, we're more and more eager to stretch our abilities in new directions and some of the things we're choosing to do with games is to engage with real-world issues that affect other aspects of our lives. Wow, that's fascinating. <clears throat> um, okay, we've got more questions here. Um, you've been traveling through Europe for a couple of months. What can you say about European authors? Do you have any examples of transmedia story storytelling that impressed you? Do you think the European publishing industry is very different from what you've seen in the U.S.? There's a lot I'm still trying to process about this trip. I've certainly met transmedia producers in almost every country we've visited on the trip, and they're doing some really interesting and cutting-edge work. Not always around books, in some cases around film or television shows or games, but they're experimenting in a variety of different kinds of networks. I think the, big, the biggest difference I've seen is that American transmedia has been very much bound up with a commercial industry. Um, as all media production in the United States has been. And American transmedia producers have struggled with whether what they produce is content that is part of the story or publicity, part of the mechanisms by which stories are promoted. And the commercial logic there shapes to a large degree what transmedia can be. I think in Europe, state-supported media is much more the norm, as is a tradition of art cinema. And so what we're seeing is more avant-garde practice, more educational use of transmedia, maybe more activist use of transmedia, that it's shaped by the imperatives of state funding in ways that are very, very interesting. That it's understood as an artistic practice much more directly in some European countries than it's yet achieved in the United States.
so that, it, you know, in the United States, uh, transmedia means the matrix, and Europe, it might mean Peter Greenaway. And I think those are some significant differences in the status of practice across those, across those countries. Um, I, you know, I think there's a lot we still have to learn from each other and a lot we still have to understand about what transmedia means in different contexts. I think a lot of Americans assume transmedia and entertainment is mostly tied to the digital. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily so. The transmedia simply means across media platforms. And so we can imagine a transmedia story that's incredibly low-tech, that takes advantage of print culture, live performance, um, music, painting, um, you know, so forth, and that plays itself out in very traditional ways. In that sense, Carnival in Brazil or in Venice is a transmedia practice of longstanding that takes advantage of every available communication channel to bring people together in a participatory spectacle that tells some kind of story or theme that's important to the culture. And so I think part of what we need to understand as we look globally is we have different access to different kinds of production, different scales of, of cultural activity, and uh, the mix of media is going to differ dramatically as we look at the United States and Europe. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, Professor Jenkins, um, may I ask what is your favorite movie? <laughs> I'm, as a fan, I'm so hard, it's actually surprisingly hard for me to pick my favorites. Uh, you know, at one time I would have said Citizen Kane was my favorite movie, but that's when I had certain academic pretensions that I don't have to prove to anyone anymore. <laughs> my childhood favorite is probably 5,000 Fingers of Dr. T, which is a very obscure Dr. Seuss musical, live action musical from the 1950s. My favorite recent film is probably Aliens. Um, which I think does an extraordinary, is an extraordinary use of science fiction through film. But the thing is, as a fan, I'm fan fans, being a fan to me describes ways of relating to all kinds of media content. Over the last 30 years of being a fan, there are probably hundreds of films and television shows that have been part of my fan cultural consumption. Mm -hmm. To me, it means consuming culture socially, so that fan television or films are things that I talk about with other fans. It's doing it with passion. It's doing it with close attention to detail, it's a television show, watching every episode, and with a creative license to go beyond what's on the screen, to tell my own version of the story, to speculate, to imagine new directions for the story. So for me, it's less about picking favorites than it is about finding a way of relating to culture that grows out of my lifetime of being part of very active fan communities. Well, this is so interesting. My husband and I are totally into Mad Men, and sometimes we'll sit around for dinner and talk about it in a very, I don't know, like it's re these are real people. And I think amazing. that's very much what fans <laughs> do. I yeah. mean, and Mad Men lends itself to both discussion of the characters, the, time. the times. Mm -hmm. You know, and I know fans who blog just tracking down the original ad campaigns in Mad Men and what's, yeah. you know, what what's true and what's not uh, yeah. about it. So there is a kind of mode of fact-checking that's yes. very fanish, but there's also a mode of speculating and imagining the future <laughs> of Don Draper and the, yes. other, the other characters on the show. There's also a mode of fan performance that is people now, several people, several companies are producing Mad Men's themed clothes and people are dressing up or on the web you can Mad Men yourself and take your icon and turn oh. it into <laughs> a character the look and feel mm. of that period. So there are mm -hmm. ways of performing Mad Men mm -hmm. that encourage our participation. So it's a great example of not a text that is done deeply in the transmedia. Matthew Weiner, the producer of Mad Men, really wants us to watch the show and right. not have a lot of other stuff right. around it, but it, is, it is, cannot help but function in a culture where we are going to seek out information through other media channels Absolutely. and socially engage with each other around the shows that we watch. Absolutely. It's fascinating. Um, here's another one. How is the concept of author copyright Author's copyright changing with this new transmedia storytelling. I think we talked about this a little bit before. Will this present new challenges to libraries, and how can they cope with it? Well, let me focus on the library part, since I did speak a little bit before yeah. about the, the, the copyright question more generally. I mean, I yeah. think librarian, libraries will play some really crucial roles in this new environment. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one of those roles is to kind of be the mentor or coach that helps citizens find access to reliable information, to develop strategies 
for processing the complex sets of information they have access to on the web. So I've been a sharp critic of sort of mandatory filtering on school computers because in fact it doesn't help young people acquire literacy or critical thinking skills. It blocks access to information rather than changing the way people engage with information. I don't think young people are more safe when they have to deal with the internet on their own outside of school. I think they're safer when librarians are informed supporters mm -hmm. of the strategies they use to access information. And so they need, librarians should play a very active role in defending access to information, as the American Library Association and other groups of librarians around the world have been doing, but also develop, become key players in developing the new media literacies that young people are involved with. That should include awareness of copyright or awareness of what does and doesn't damage this, the status of authorial material. That is, plagiarism is on the rise, and it exists a long remix, which, and I think we have to help young people make a distinction between them. The plagiarism copies purely for the purpose of profiting from someone else's work and taking credit for it. It attempts to mask the origins of the original material. Remix often seeks to uh, call attention to the juxtaposition of materials. To sort of it creates something new, it's generative, it's creative, it forces us to think about that new material in new ways, and as a result, it's in fact part of the ongoing dialogue that exists between the text and the culture. So this is not a legal distinction, but it's an intellectual or ethical distinction between different ways we build on each other's work. Mm -hmm. And so in a book I have coming out this fall called Reading in a Participatory Culture, we describe work we've done through the schools uh, using Moby Dick as our basic case study to look at how we teach culture different literary texts differently in a culture of remix. How do we help young people see remix as the modern equivalent of illusions? That is, Melville makes allusions to the Bible, to Shakespeare, mm -hmm. so forth in that text. He remixed 19th century culture in a variety of ways and make a distinction between that and plagiarism. Because I think part of what school librarians particularly have to be attentive to is the ethical uses of sources and information mm -hmm. in a time when copyright itself is in contention. Yeah. OK. Um, here's another one. Uh, can you talk a little bit about social media in the developing world and how it is establishing links to the developed world? Well, if we could go back to the CUNY 2012 example that yeah. I used earlier, I think it's a really interesting case. Yeah. So imagine that the Invisible Children as an organization had produced a video and broadcast it on American television that dealt with the issue in Uganda. By and large, it would have been, clo it would have been a closed conversation that Americans participated in, and it would not have been a global conversation. And I think the conversation would have been deeply impoverished by that that experience. That what we saw was people in Uganda were exposed to the video. They, it was debated throughout the African countries that Africans created videos and blog posts and Twitter posts to engage with it. The Prime Minister of Uganda, in fact, created a video to respond directly to the debate. And many of those videos were watched in North America and Europe in ways that changed their, a lot of people's perspectives about how we debate issues affecting the developing world. Having said that, we have to be very clear that the world is not flat. Anyone who tells you the world is flat is lying. That there are gross inequalities in access to media, the language problems we talked about earlier block many developing countries and their citizens from participating. There are regulatory structures that make it hard for everyday people to participate in the internet in various parts of the world. That We do not have equal access to the capacity to communicate. And that's a deep challenge I think we face. There's still a lot of work to be done before the developed world can meaningfully communicate on an ongoing basis with the developed world, certainly in a way that goes beyond, say, African scam artists trying to, mm. trying to get people's money and goes to the level where we actually conduct a meaningful dialogue across national borders about the policies and concerns that affect the planet. But I think we're seeing the beginnings of what that communication would look like. My colleague, Ethan, Z Ethan Zuckerman, who is part of the same MacArthur Research Network and I, has used what he calls the cute cat theory of political change, in which he says any technology robust enough to allow us to exchange pictures of cute cats um, is also strong enough to change a government or challenge governmental policies. And so he's arguing that as people begin to experiment with social media and begin to build networks of communication with each other, they both develop the technological infrastructure mm 
<laughs> and acquire the latent capacity to communicate in more serious ways. And it goes back to what I said earlier about we learn through play skills we're going to apply to more serious questions. So right now, the exchanges between the developed and the developing world may be around popular culture, it may be around music, it may be around films, it may be around travel, but it soon and increasingly is going to deal with the environment, with global hunger, with international relations, and I think that will be the next phase in the ways we relate as citizens to each other in, in, a, sort of, in a planet that's increasingly closed, if not flat. Okay. We have one more question. Okay. Um, and here it is. It's from Spider-Man. Okay. Oh, great. He's a friendly neighborhood, <laughs> uh, a neighborhood friend of mine, yes. Spider-Man. Do you think the spread of mobile devices was the defining moment for social media? I think that ma that differs from country to country. Certainly yeah. in Scandinavia and Japan and other parts of the Pacific Rim, mobile media was the tipping point. More people got access to the web in general through mobile technologies than through computing. I think in the American context, we've been surprisingly slow to develop mobile media. I think that, you know, for us, the social media platforms, uh, Facebook, MySpace, Twitter, played a much more central role in shaping the ways we connect with our social relationships. A crucial factor here is mobility more generally. That is, in the 1960s, Alvin Toffler predicted that Americans would devote less and less time to the people who lived around them because we moved so often from city to city. The average American moves once every five years, often across regions in searching for work and education. And social media for Americans has been about regaining damaged social connections. Everyone I knew in high school that I lost touch with, I rediscovered on Facebook. And family members that I might not have chance to communicate on a regular basis keep up to date with what's happening in my life through those kinds of social media. Mm -hmm. In parts of the world where mobility is not such a factor, where people grow up and grow old in the same village or the same town or the same city, other reasons motivate their use of social media. And I think mobility, the ability to communicate from wherever you are, plays a really crucial role, that lowering the technological and economic threshold of access for much of the developing world by shifting to the mobile phone allowed communication to take place that wouldn't, might not have happened otherwise. So we're seeing, for example, in the developing world, the empowerment of women who once married and moved to another village and were mm -hmm. cut off from their family networks, mm -hmm. in many cases, now retain connections to other family members. And so they're mobilizing around domestic violence for example, in very different ways because they have access to that strong social network and they're using the mobile phone as the way of reaching out and communicating to each other what's happened in their lives. And I think that's a different kind of change yeah. than we've seen in the American context where Facebook is about connecting our own high school friends together years later. That's true. <laughs> yes, okay, I said that was the last question, but um, I was wrong. We have one more question. But this is an interesting one. Um, Professor Jenkins, can you really visualize a mom or dad reading bedtime stories to a four-year-old kid on a Kindle? No illustrations, no touching of paper, no noise from pages flipped. It just doesn't feel right. I think it's a valid point. Uh, what is it that Alice in Wonderland tells us? What's the use of a book without illustrations? Yeah. The difference, though, is I think Kindle is a stepping point towards something that's potentially richer. So I discovered with Convergence Culture, the sidebars, which are very much part of that book, couldn't be reproduced on the Kindle. The book, it's incredibly linear, it's incredibly restrictive. As we turn to the iPad, we are seeing experiences where there are pictures, where there's potential for other kinds of interaction, uh, where, in fact, parents are being taught new skills at reading books with their kids and at encouraging multi-generational play. So I don't, you know, the Kindle, I think, is, a, is not where we're going to end up. But I do think that there are ways that digital books may help some parents who may, you know, have maybe not had the experience of interacting creatively with a book with their kids, find ways to do so. And I think we will see more illustrative, more interactive kinds of books, which encourage cross-generational play. Very good answer. Thank you so much. And that's the end of our web chat. Thank you, Professor Jenkins, so much for Goodbye. So.